Hi, this is John with WesleyGospel.com. Um, I am going to give a critical evaluation of what I know about John Bevere and some of his teachings. Um, he has a book called Undercover, which teaches the covering and the shepherding movement concept. And he has a, move, uh, a, a book called uh, The Bait of Satan, which it's a title I heard about 20 years ago, but only now I realize that this is where the offense teaching comes from in the charismatic movement. So I was um, musing on this today, and I've drawn the conclusion that I believe that the offense teaching that exists within the charismatic churches among pastors might very well be the root of all of the heresies that tend to crop up in the charismatic movement. Uh, it's just a theory I have. I mean, I've been charismatic for 25 years, but I'm going to try to unpack my theory of this. I'm going to try to be gracious as much as I can, but I care about the truth of the Word of God, and I also care about how people are being treated in church. And um, I'm going to come down with a hammer on what I believe is false teaching when I see it and experience it. I'm the recipient of it. And I believe that these two books, Bait of Satan and Undercover by John Bevere, have had such a tremendous impact on charismatic Christians and especially upon charismatic pastors. And there's no question, or Bait, and, Bait of Satan came out in 1994, there's no question in my mind that that book especially, which teaches the offense teaching, if you hear this word offense, and there's this teaching on offense being taught by charismatic pastors, it's coming from John Bevere. And it sometimes gets regurgitated by people like Bill Johnson and other people in deliverance ministry. I, I, I understand what they're trying to do. They're trying to let people let go of their grudges, their bitterness, and their unforgiveness, which is extremely important in spiritual de deliverance. However, the way I've seen it fleshed out, the way I've seen it acted out by charismatic pastors especially, is pretty twisted and weird, and I want to speak to that. I don't want to lay all of the blame at John Bevere's feet. However, it's hard for me not to, because he is not only the, uh, the author of this offense teaching, but he is also the author of the coverings teaching. And so therefore, I look at him as the chief problem with charismatic pastors today. And if you've ever been in a charismatic church for more than six months, and you knew that there was something wrong with the way that that charismatic pastor treated you, I can gamble and I can bet 90% of that mistreatment that you experienced from that charismatic pastor was because of these two books by John Bevere, Bait of Satan and Undercover, these teachings on offense and coverings. It's a lot to unpack. I'll try my best to explain it, but it's a pretty simple explanation for a very complicated teaching. It sort of goes like this. Charismatic pastors have a direct pipeline to God through the Holy Spirit. They can hear direct from God. And so they feel privileged as sons and daughters and children's, children of the king. In fact, they, they are royalty because their, their dad is the king. So they can act like royalty. They can act like spoiled little, entitled little brats. And God will still love them no matter what. Now, the Bible is the Word of God, 
It's inerrant. It's infallible. It's inspired. And therefore, that's great. But you see, these charismatic pastors are have a direct pipeline to the Holy Spirit. And so, if 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 you have a different point of view about the Word of God, and you email the pastor, and you talk about it to the pastor, they will experience offense because you dared to insult their royal honor with a different point of view about the Word of God than they have. And so now they call that offense. In normal terminology, it's called an insult. But they will call that offense, okay? <clears throat> now, the definition of the word offense is annoyance or resentment brought about by a perceived insult to or disregard for oneself or one's standards or principles. How dare you insult my reputation? How dare you believe and once saved, always saved, when I believe in conditional security, or vice versa. How dare you question my, my views about sonship? How dare you question my views about the orphan spirit? Okay. So this is what's going on. You got all these people coming into these charismatic churches. They hear something weird. And they say, my Bible doesn't say that. They come to the pastor about it. The pastor doesn't want to deal with it. The pastor is self-centered, narcissistic, and image conscious, and calls that offense. And so now, they're going to have a super spiritual, sanctimonious approach to quote-unquote forgiving this person for this offense of bringing up a different point of view about the Word of God. An offense to their honor. Right? See how narcissistic this is? How prideful, egocentric this is? And so what the per past charismatic pastor will then do is just simply ghost the person, ignore the person, and encourage the person to leave the church. Then the charismatic pastor will go through a coping mechanism to quote-unquote forgive this person for daring to bring up a different point of view or perspective or view about the Word of God than they hold to. They might even preach a sermon on offense to help them process their thoughts about it. The reality is, is the person was ignored. The points of view were disregarded or ignored. They will go back to the way they were thinking. They will put this person out of their mind and completely forget about them because they will call them the accuser of the brethren and all of their words are offense. Okay, so they have these these weird phrases and these really weird vocabulary words that they use, right? They've brainwashed themselves into handling these things without humbling themselves underneath the authority of the Word of God from other members in the body of Christ. It's their way of being unrebukable. You can't rebuke me from the Word of God because I know who I am. And you can't, you can't correct me. Um, so there's a lot of arrogance and pride and egocentricity associated with this offense teaching. It might at some times and in some cases be used for good, like for people who are having trouble with bearing a grudge and having bitterness and unforgiveness towards a person who's truly hateful and mean. That's, that's a, a legitimate. But to use the word offense is unbiblical. It's an unbiblical word. Okay. And, and by, by focusing on resentment about a perceived insult, okay, is, is more, is, seems to be more focused about just being irritated rather than let's deal with the truth of God's word. There seems to be an issue around this that charismatic pastors who don't really care about the Word of God, charismatic pastors who are snobs and spoiled little entitled brats of the king, a little military brats of, of Jesus, the king of kings and lord of lords, most snobbish little purple royalty kids rolling around in silken garments, uh, who can never be rebuked for anything. 
And so if anybody comes up with the Bible rebuke in a gentle spirit, in a mean spirit, it doesn't matter. If it's the Word of God, it needs to be taken seriously. You know? It needs to be taken seriously. I mean, I don't care if a person comes up to me with a ghetto attitude. If they're quoting the Bible at me, I need to listen to it. Because I might have some biblical blind spots, and I might need to adjust some of my theological perspectives under the authority of God's Word. And I don't care what kind of attitude this person in the church has. I want to hear what the Word of God says. Maybe there's something about the Word of God they know that I need to know about. I need to hear, I need to have the humility to listen to it. And I don't care about humiliating my reputation under their rebuke. I want to listen to what that guy or that gal has to say. And I don't care if they get ghetto on me or not. If they are talking about the Bible, I need to listen to what they have to say. That's a humble attitude. But you see, this offense teaching, it turns all that on its head. It turns it around. It makes charismatic pastors unreprovable, I believe. It makes them unrebukable. The charismatic offense teaching, I believe, is just an excuse for pastors not accepting biblical correction from other people in their church. It's self-centered. It's prideful. It makes charismatic pastors feel like they don't even have to receive Bible rebukes from other people at church. Now, while it's true that not every corrective word from people in church is valid, if you're a pastor, you need to give everyone a fair hearing. Otherwise, you're a horrible leader. I believe that the charismatic, quote-unquote, offense teaching that probably originated with John Bevere and now is being touted by people like Bill Johnson and, 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 and Randy Clark, I believe that this spirit of offense teaching this charismatic offense teaching is a false doctrine that makes charismatic pastors feel like they're unrebukable, unreprovable, don't need to receive biblical correction from other people in their church or from other preachers. And so what it does is it actually, because of that, it actually leads to the charismatic pastors accepting even more false doctrines and views about the Bible. It's a non-debate concept. Debate is, see, debate is allowable in Baptist and in Presbyterian Christianity. Debate's fine, and that's why they have sound doctrine among them, because everybody's point of view is shared and is uh, tossed around. That's why they have sound doctrine. Debate is acceptable in Reformed Christianity. But in Charismatic Christi Christianity, it seems that debate is not acceptable. It seems that debate is not acceptable. The only person who's a Charismatic that debates people is Michael Brown. What about all the others? When was the last time you ever saw Bill Johnson in a theological debate panel, right? It's this offense teaching, right, looks upon anybody else who thinks differently than you as just an insulter. When in actuality, they might be another member of the body of Christ being sent by the Lord to help you Break out of some blind spots that you have, but you have so much honor and self-respect about yourself that you're going to call that offense rather than rebuke from the Word of God, Titus 1.9. It's a non-debate concept. That's why charismatics don't hold debates. Offense. Yeah, what, what is that? Bearing a grudge against a mean spirit, okay, I get it, I get it. But when we're talking about people with different points of view about the Word of God, expressing them in the church, and then you're calling that offense, and then you ghost them like a middle schooler, okay, what are we, what is this? What are we dealing with here? This is very, very bad pastoring. It's a non-debate concept, and it leads to cult-like behavior among charismatic pastors. I believe that this charismatic offense teaching is a teaching about quote-unquote forgiveness that does not require personal repentance, change, moral or doctrinal improvement, or theological adjustment in the life of the charismatic pastor. I believe that this charismatic offense teaching cultivates 
no love for biblical truth in the lives of charismatic pastors. You don't have to love what the truth of the Word of God says if you hold to this offense teaching. All you have to do is label anyone who disagrees with you about anything. And now they're the accusers of the brethren and all their words are offense. You see how weird and false and counterfeit and shallow this teaching is once it's unpacked. I believe that this charismatic offense teaching makes people say, I'll keep a distance from people who ever dare to insult my reputation, and I'll quote-unquote forgive them on the inside, while at the same time forgetting about everything that they said earlier, and I'll go on in exactly the same way that I was before just by ignoring them, accepting no correction from anyone in my church under any circumstances, it's so childlike. It's childish. I believe that this charismatic offense teaching is dangerous, it's cult-like, and it's egocentric when it's lived out by charismatic pastors. But it has a form of sanctimonious godliness about it. It has a form of godliness. It's about, quote-unquote, forgiving. No, it's not about forgiving. It's not. Oftentimes, it's not. It's I don't accept correction from people. I ghost people who disagree with me. And I forget about everything they said. That's what the offense teaching is, oftentimes. That's how I've seen it used by charismatic pastors. Forgive and forget the people who disagree with me. Call them accusers of the brethren and all their words offense. <laughs> wow, that's false. It's so unreasonable. Anti-intellectual and immoral, and narcissistic, egocentric, and cult-like. It's something a cult leader would think about. It's authoritarian. It's all about your own reputation. How dare you insult my reputation, right? That's what it's about. It has a form of godliness about it. Quote, unquote, forgiveness about it. Not really. It's not genuine forgiveness because ghosting people is not forgiveness. Okay? Real forgiveness, real biblical forgiveness, is aimed at social reconciliation between both parties underneath the authority of Scripture. Real biblical forgiveness is centered around the teaching of Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 15, if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, they have to admit that they've committed sins. In other words, they are underneath the authority of Scripture. They say to you, I've sinned against the Word of God, and I've sinned against God, and I've sinned against you. They're admitting sin, okay? And they ask your forgiveness. And if you hold a grudge against them and don't forgive them, God will hold a grudge against you. All right. That's the Bible teaching on forgiveness. But when you got mean-spirited people that don't come under the authority of God's word, don't acknowledge their sin, and they're just being mean-spirited, okay, now you're in a, in a different situation where you're dealing with unreasonable, stubborn people that don't repent for sin and don't acknowledge or confess sin. Those people can be avoided. Those are different. Those are different case. Okay. But when I'm talking about unreasonable, charismatic pastors who don't ever accept correction, and then they call that offense, and they call that accuser of the brethren, and then they call that forgiveness by just forgetting people who bring up aspects about the Word of God that they don't fully understand yet because they don't want their immature and they don't want to talk about it. Okay, now, now we're dealing with people who are just unreasonable and don't want to accept correction from the Word of God from other people. Because they are high on their selves. They've got a power trip. How dare you, how dare you correct me? How dare you hold a candle to me? I am a saint and child of God. All right, now you're dealing with a prideful, arrogant, cult-like person who can never receive correction from others. Now you're, now you're dealing with an unreasonable kind of a person. And they're throwing around this offense teaching to defend the behavior. So it deceives people into thinking that they are, they are being forgiving towards so-called accusers of the brethren in their church 
when actually all it is is just an emotional self-help coping method for these charismatic pastors who do not want to accept biblical correction or change their ways. It encourages people, especially charismatic pastors, it encourages them to hold to their own views stubbornly and unchallenged and not hear or listen to the theological views of others about the Word of God. And so in that sense, this offense teaching is anti-sanctification because it's not about sincerely obeying the Bible or getting better at understanding or, interpret or interpreting the Bible. No, the offense teaching is just about my rep, my rep, my rep. The culture of honor. Humility, which is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, says... I don't care if you come at me in a, with a mean spirit. I don't care if you come at me with the right spirit. If you have some valid things from the Word of God to say to me, I want to hear it because I submit my life to the Word of God. So bring it on. What do you have to say to me about the Word of God? I, have, I want to listen to you. A humble attitude will always say that and will not rely, rely on an offense teaching or an accuser of the brethren teaching, or anything other like that, to falsely justify a charismatic pastor to not hear what people have to say about Scripture. The fact that the person is plugging their ears about what these people have to say about these other points of view about the Word of God is a really clear sign that that person is just a spoiled brat and is relying on weird charismatic offense teachings or accuser of the brethren teachings or covering teachings or culture of honor teachings. They're cover-ups. The Lord sees through all of this. The Lord sees through all of this that these are just cover-ups for the fact that they are unreprovable people. And it's just a sign that they're horrible leaders. Horrible leaders. I believe that this charismatic offense teaching encourages narcissism among charismatic pastors and makes them act like, or lets them act like spoiled, entitled, rich little brats of the king. I believe that this charismatic uh, offense teaching is a prideful teaching that makes charismatic pastors ignore what could very well be words of biblical correction from other members of the body of Christ who have different points of view about the Word of God. I believe that this charismatic offense, accuser of the brethren, culture of honor, covering, because it's all related, this allows charismatic pastors to keep their pride and their ego intact and enables them to ward off all apparent attacks on their reputation and shun all forms of personal shame and public humiliation so that they may be quote-unquote honored with the praises that they think are due them as favored children of God. Whether you call it offense, whether you call it accuser of the brethren, whether you call it culture of honor, coverings, or sonship, all of this stuff is wrapped together to to intellectually justify charismatic pastors not listening to other people's points of view. That's the issue. That is the ultimate problem why there are so many false teachings in the charismatic movement. It's an unreasonableness there. And it's related to these weird teachings. Now, holding a grudge is a sin. A normal Christian person would always say, nobody should just harbor bitterness, hate, and unforgiveness towards people who are mean-spirited, hateful, and unreasonable. Holding a grudge, bearing a grudge against a person is a sin. But is there biblical rebuke in this case that we're thinking about? I don't care if the person is hateful and mean, has a bad attitude, or anything like that. Is there... Is there something, listen, if you're a pastor, is there something from the Bible this person is saying that you need to hear? How much humility do you have to listen? 
Well, which kind of a person are we dealing with here? You're a pastor. You receive an email. You receive a word from somebody. It grates against your, your carnality. It grates against your pride, your ego. But do they have something valid to say, to share with you? Is there something in there? Or are you just going to label it all Satan and forgive it, but forget about it? Because you're a kid of the king. Are you, that is so spiritually immature. That's like a middle school kid. And I don't care if you're 60 or 70 years old. That's like a middle school kid. God sees through all of your petty little offense teachings. He sees the fact that you just do not want to accept correction. And he will judge your life over that. He will judge your life over that. Are we dealing with the Bible rebuke? Or are we dealing with the hateful and mean person who has no Bible rebuke? Which one are we dealing with? Maybe we're dealing with both. But even then, a humble person, a humble charismatic pastor, a humble person will always want to hear what the Word of God says in order that they may obey it properly. I don't care what offense teaching you hold to, you say, or teach about. If it means that you're never willing to change your points of view about the Bible, then your problem is pride. You need to stop talking about the spirit of offense, and you need to start talking about the spirit of pride. Because pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And you're probably only, whoever you are, you're probably, nine times out of ten, I think in a majority of cases, these charismatic pastors are mainly only using this stupid offense teaching as a cover-up for the fact that they're stubborn. They can't accept correction from anyone. And so what they will do is they will just ghost people, ignore people, and quote-unquote forgive them on the inside by just simply forgetting about them and putting them out of their minds and call that forgiveness. Yeah, that's really spiritually mature. Yeah, th but that's more like how a middle school girl would handle a breakup with her boyfriend. In other words, it's just, it's just a cover-up for narcissism. It's all it is. It's... it's Real biblical forgiveness actually aims at social reconciliation underneath the authority of the Word of God. But you see, I believe that this charismatic offense teaching, false teaching, I believe that this charismatic offense teaching is a false teaching about forgiveness. And it just means simply that pastors don't need to accept correction from anyone in their church. They can just ghost people who think differently about the Bible, and they can just, quote-unquote, just forgive them, quote-unquote, by forgetting about them entirely. It's false. It's nasal-gazing, false, ah, blah, 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 I forget about everybody, and just, and just be with me, myself, and I. It's self-centered. It's narcissistic. It doesn't, it doesn't, you know what it is? It's rebuke half the time. It's most of the time. It's rebuke, but you're calling it offense. It's what the Bible calls rebuke. You're calling offense and you don't accept correction and God's going to judge your life for that. Now, are there people who legitimately get hurt by others? Yeah. Are there people who have emotional problems with grudges? Yeah. But that's what you call a grudge. It's called a grudge. Normal language, popular parlance, it's called a grudge. Now, if you want to be orthodox, let's talk about it like that. Don't use this word offense because I believe in most cases this offense teaching is about people not willing to accept correction, people just forgetting about people, ignoring people, ghosting people, and quote-unquote forgiving them by forgetting about them and not accepting correction. I believe it's a false teaching about forgiveness. The real teaching here should be to not hold a grudge about people who are just unreasonable and mean-spirited. If you've got a bully in your life, okay, 
You don't want to hold a grudge against that person because it'll destroy your spirit. That person can't be dealt with. That person's unreasonable. And yeah, those people need to be avoided. But um, I'm telling you, I believe that this offense teaching is utterly false. It's not about, it's not usually about letting go of grudges against bullies. I believe that this charismatic offense teaching is about people not willing to accept correction from the Bible, ignoring everyone, and just loving me, myself, and I. That's what I believe that this teaching is about. If you have a real bully in your life, all right, and the Bible is not even part of that conversation, and they're just a bully, okay, the Word of God says, do not hold a grudge against that person. Bless those who persecute you. Forgive them who despitefully use you and persecute you. And yes, you're going to have to, blessed is the man that sits not in the seat of scoffers. Avoid them, right? But I'm telling you, I, that's not what I believe I see in this offense teaching. This offense teaching is something different than just not holding a grudge against mean people. This offense teaching is about, I can't accept correction. I don't need to accept correction. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to ignore anybody else who ever thinks differently than me and just put them out of my mind. That's what I believe the offense teaching boils down to, and that's why I believe it's so false. <clears throat> and it might very well be the root or the trunk of the tree of heresy that exists within the NAR. They're not willing to think about any new doctrines, any new teachings from the Word of God, from the Reform side, because everything's just offense to them. You see that? I believe it might very well be the root problem for all the false teachings that, is, that exist within the New Apostolic Reformation. God bless out there. This is John with WesleyGospel.com.